Ready? Pretty good. Need a woman. Ready? Uh oh. <laughs> Not bad. Thanks, Miami. <laughs> so, statistically, you're going to forget about 80% of my presentation. Unless, of course, you're holding a golf ball. In which case, you're going to remember 100% because you're going to be up on the stage here in a few minutes. <laughs> if you have stage fright, I would suggest you take your golf ball and quietly slip it into the person sitting next to your pocket. <laughs> Hi. So did that video make you feel a little bit uneasy? Maybe you've seen it before, but it certainly did to me. And if I, if I put on my HR analytics learning kind of headset, there's a few thoughts that come to mind as I watch that video that I wanted to share. So a couple statistics for you. Uh, first one is 77% uh, of HR professionals are unsure how the workforce potential is affecting their company's bottom line, 77%. Next sad fact from our friends from Burson. 6% of HR departments feel they are excellent in analytics. 60% feel they're poor. You depressed yet? So if I asked if, how many people in this room right now are working on predictive analytics that does not involve turnover? Raise your hand. I see one, one person? Two? OK. So that same question was asked by KPMG to about 400 senior leaders across the globe. And the response to that question was, our HR, 85% of them said, our HR team does not excel in predictive analytics. So they actually have a more optimistic perspective than what's happening in this room. So there, there's actually good news in this, even though it sounds pretty dire. But the good news is that it's a race of the turtles. <laughs> so. Whether you are the turtle in the back or the turtle in the front, you're not that far behind. And we're, this is our space, right? So I think the good news here is that no matter where you are, there's opportunity to close that gap. And yeah, there's a couple of jackrabbits out there, but the reality is that this is a burgeoning area, and it's an area that this, the folks in this room obviously are, are really excited about, as am I. So thought number two. This is a hot space. I was talking to Jeffrey Burke and Kevin Oaks this morning, and th this is probably the hottest area in HR right now, if you think about it. And you think about sort of what's happening to the market. The consultants are just pumping a bunch of money and bulking up their resources. The software companies are beginning to you know, build in analytic tools. So it's, it's, the market's there, and now is the time to execute on that. So it's, it's not a fad. I saw this in the video. I have no idea what exabytes are. I know there are a lot. But the interesting thing about this is that it doubles every 40 months. Think about that. I mean, that's just it's unbelievable. So big data is getting bigger exponentially. So and why is this happening? I think we all know that it's really about the, the, the cloud. I mean, everyone talks about the cloud, but it's the price point and the ability to store data is becoming a heck of a lot cheaper, the ability to use more powerful tools, the aggregation of data. Uh, has made this all possible. And you know, quite frankly, it's just going to continue as we go forward. So driving change. This is an opportunity to challenge the status quo. I mean, we all know that HR departments are great at looking in the rearview mirror, measuring transactions, operations, headcount, demographics, diversity, time to fill that, that kind of stuff. It does not move the needle. It's table stakes, let's be honest. Trending, benchmarking, looking at you know, kind of point in time over point in time is, again, interesting, probably a little bit more helpful in terms of where you're taking your business. But is it really driving business results? Probably not. The holy grail in all this, as we know, is around predictive analytics and, and big data. And the opportunity that we have truly to change the conversation 
and, and begin to use measurement to manage and make decisions based on, based on that is profound. So my, all the other questions were that that fish mixed together, fishbowl. So big data, ride the wave. You know, it's coming. It's going to hit you if you're not ready. Uh, analytic, HR analytics is hot. This is coming from a, a talent learning guy. This is the hottest area in HR, in my opinion, and driving change. Now is the time to change a conversation to, to bust up the status quo. So I forgot to introduce myself. This is who I am. This is, this is who I really am. This is where I'm from. This is where I live. This is what I like to do, obviously. <laughs> this is what I also like to do, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't sound right. Um, <laughs> it wasn't that way in rehearsal. This is where I work. This is what we hope happens in 30 months at First Data. And if this goes really well, I get to do more of this. I get to do more of this. And I'll do more of that. So, golf ball holders, where are you? I'm going to welcome you up to the stage. Come on up. There should be four of you. <clears throat> Why don't we just stand over here? Uh, we're missing someone. Is it? Oh, there we go. Okay, come on over here, guys. All right, just, uh, all right. So, first of all, do we have any golfers in the group? Golfer, what's your name? Michael Cafaro. Nice to meet you, Michael. All right, why don't you put your ball right here? And <laughs> all right, you see Kent Barnett over here? Okay. Are you, are you pretty good or not I'll so good? Shank it over there and, uh... Yeah. Uh, okay, maybe not. No. We've already had two people fall at the conference, so we don't want to risk more liability, right, Kent? All right, so uh, Michael. Uh, welcome, and uh, could we get the rest of your names? Mike. Mike? Pam. Pam, I know you. Sonny. Hey, Sonny. All right. So, <clears throat> give me your golf ball back. So you have both the task or the burden to pick my topics that I'm going to talk about. And we're going to pop them up here. This is kind of the potpourri of learning, analytics, big data. And since we didn't have a polling device, I thought, you know, it'd be better for you to pick the topics we're going to talk about. There's a couple uh, in here that are a little bit deeper than others. but So with that, uh, Michael, uh, why don't you pick your topic? What do you want? Well, you know, um, two looks really interesting. Three, three looks interesting. But and I kind of like the IPO thing, because there's an opportunity to maybe make some money there. True. Good point. So. All right, so you didn't answer. You didn't answer. Oh, two. OK, two. All right. Mike? Uh, I'm going to say number three. Number three. OK. Pam. Well, I know Kent, and I know he likes to party, so number 10 for sure. All right. <laughs> OK. Number 10. You OK? Number six. Sonny, number six. All right. Someone's going to have to keep me honest. We're going to try to stick to that. So it was two, three, six, and 10, right? All right. You guys are officially done. How about a round of applause? That was pretty easy, wasn't it? You can hang on to your golf ball. All right. So um, I get a captain's pick because I was here last year, and Frank was our moderator, and we talked about loading up a new corporate university. And it was a really fun year. And, uh, and I think it sets the kind of the context of some of these other uh, points. So why don't we tee that one up, and then we'll move to the topics that you've selected. All right, so this is what we were looking at in July of 2011. We just got approval to build a global virtual university, a new leadership development program, and an innovation center, learning innovation center. So obviously, the good news here is that we didn't have to take apart anything. We didn't have to dismantle anything. The implication is that there wasn't much there to start with, right? So we said. You know, let's think about the design features of a global university. We have 24,000 employees across the globe. We know that we can't hit everyone with face-to-face -face training, so how can we deliver some training pretty quick that's meaningful and moves the needle from a business perspective? So 
these are the things our team came up with, and you've already hit on a few of them. I'd need two hours to kind of go through each of them. But, you know, integrated talent management, uh, gamification we thought would be kind of fun. Uh, commercial content, mobile ready, uh, five academies, award winning, crowdsourcing. So you can see these are sort of the design principles. So that was literally in July of 2011. So I'm just going to focus on a couple here and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll kind of move on for that. So the one thing that um, we started with, so you think about, okay, so you got these design features and you're building this university. Well, what do you suppose was the very first thing that we wanted? The very first thing. All right, a cool name. We didn't know what to call it. We're in team meetings and talking about, we're going to build this thing. What is it? We don't know. So this is the first project we had, a cool name. So not K-U-H-L, C-O-O-L. So we talked about, you know, everyone's using, you know, university, first data university, Motorola, I don't know what, Claudia, your name is, but a lot of, you know, universities were pretty common. We thought, this is not your typical university. This is electronic. We want it fast, we want gamification, we want social embedded. And so we said, we can't use the conventional sort of thinking. It's not bricks and mortar. And so we said, we can't use First Data University for two reasons. One was old school. The second is the acronym. Everyone loves acronyms. Isn't so good if you take the D out. <laughs> so that one didn't get very far. So then we thought about, OK, this is meant to be much more innovative, much more forward thinking brandable, something that really resonates that might be a little different. So then the last thing was innovation. It's so important to us to tie this to our business of innovation. We are a global payments company. It's going through tremendous change right now. And innovation is really you know, the, the driving force of our company. And so we wanted something that was literally tied from a branding perspective to innovation. So lo and behold, the name we came up with was MindSpring. And MindSpring at first got some kind of funny looks but it has gone viral. I mean, it's almost used as a verb for learning. I mean, it's not quite a Google, but it is, everyone is using it, we've branded it, and it has become you know, sort of omnipresent throughout First Data. So getting back to the design features, a couple that I'll touch on that I think are real uh, important for this group. Um, aligned to the business goals, learning strategy, uh, business owned, and integrated talent management. So let's start with the first one. Josh, you recognize anything? So I'll get to business goals, for, uh, but let me start with the learning strategy. We had, you know, you think about all those words that were on the blackboard. We needed to have a structure, a framework to kind of put it in that would make sense. And we looked at different models, and we landed on Burson's um, high-impact learning organization, um, A, because I love the look of it. Um, I love the fact that it's comprehensive, and the nice thing about I mean, Josh has done a masterful job of branding his, his frameworks, and I like the fact that it kind of stands the test of time, and there's a ton of research behind it. So we actually uh, joined Burson because of this exercise, quite frankly. And the benefit to us was it wasn't just sort of, okay, this cool framework, how do things fit, but it was practitioners, it was people that had gone and built universities, and it really helped inform our thinking in a very quick fashion about governance board, you know, to your point, Dave, uh, you know, the 70-20-10 that we all talk about, this concept of continuous learning, the tools, technology, you know, and, and lessons learned from others that have been there before us. So this was really a nice way to start, um, both from a pictorial perspective, but also, you know, from an intellectual perspective. So the next was really, and this is very, I think it's pretty well known, but I'll just explain why it's so important to us. We did not want this to be an HR university. This had to be owned by the business. Granted, you know, it was funded centrally for the most part, but we really wanted business ownership, business leadership, so we busted up the entire sort of concept and said, we're going to have five academies in the most, most important areas. So product, leadership, sales, uh, business academy. So we literally had five academies, and then we selected the most forward-thinking, strongest leaders in the organization that would lead and become the deans of those academies. So we had five deans. And each of those deans was given a small budget, more to kind of fix their or create their landing page in MindSpring. But also, they were, they were asked to select the best steering partners um, that they could come up with that not, you know, not just 
like learning, but we're really strong leaders, we're strong advocates for learning in the organization, because again, we went from zero to this in a very short period of time. So, um, and what we found was we had some that were incredibly activists that just literally were creating curriculum and concepts and stuff, and there were a couple others that um, wanted their picture, you know, sort of on the website, and that was it. And so we've, we've rotated them out, and quite frankly, um, it has become, you know, we have 65 steering partners that are actively involved in helping us you know, create that connectivity to the business and really select the curriculum that's really going to move uh, their business or their area. The other piece that's um, near and dear to my heart is sort of integration of this into talent management. And again, um, I think that there are, there's a lot of companies talking about how do you integrate learning into the, process, the HR processes. And when you have disparate systems, it's not the easiest thing to do. We're very much on a journey and very much, you know, trying to make that happen. But the reality is that I had the benefit of having the talent management folks report up into me. And you can see sort of the, we have learning on one side all the way through talent management. And when you get sort of that cross-functional expertise in a room talking about how do we create a university that is in integrated into the core HR processes, but also delivers a really good product from a learning perspective, um, it changed the direction of a few things. And we're still, like I say, still working on this. but. Uh, it's proven to be a real important part of kind of how we're going to market. Uh, and then this last piece um, at the bottom of that, we had a blue bar across the bottom that said GTM partner. That was a group of HR partners because a lot of companies struggle with how do you get HR sort of engaged and how do you work with, with HR, how do they become advocates and don't make you sort of a COE where you're just throwing stuff over the wall. So we literally have HR partners that are on my team that, that are the liaisons to the business. Keep us honest, keep us connected, and then also you know, help design, help create, so we get a lot of connectivity from an a organizational perspective. So the last one, and this is the most important. So we are, as I said, we are going public hopefully in 24 to 30 months, so it's all about top line growth. And everything we do, we have to think laser focus on top line growth. And yes, that's an outcome, but the reality is any levers we can pull to affect short, mid, and long-term growth is, is huge. And you know, if you look at product innovation, technical skill depth, performance culture, those all actually feed up into top-line growth. So we, placed, we doubled down on top-line growth initiatives, and sales was the area that we really put a ton of effort around. So our business goal, so connecting everything we do to that business goal was to increase EBITDA by a billion dollars in 18 months. So think about that. That's, on our margins, that's about two and a half billion dollars of new revenue in 18 months. Not easy. So to get there, there's several things we don't control. You know, and we are, since we make money when people use credit cards and debit cards and mobile technology, when the economy doesn't do so good, we don't do so good. So a lot of headwinds. Uh, from the beginning of the IPO, but market growth is a part of this equation. The other part is really the part that we focus on is sales execution. And the last part is product, product innovation. I talked about how important that was to us. And so if you think about that team structure I put up there and how it affects these areas, there's at least three areas that it directly affects. Let's talk just for a second around sales effectiveness. So this violates every rule in PowerPoint. I know you can't read it. I apologize, but I love this slide. Um, I found a way to use it. So if you think about the talent management stream and what we can affect, I've put in italics, and again, sorry, you can't read it all, the things that we could affect. We might not be able to control, but we can influence. Top left is the orange bucket. The segmentation, the organizational structure of the sales department, hugely important. And we've actually done a lot of work in this space, re, you know, changing sort of the whole go-to-market strategy and how we are set up as an organization. The blue bubble are the outcomes that we expect to see. So more effective customer relationships leading to top-line growth. Box number two, sales competency. We play a ton in this space. Everything from competency-based selection to sales training to strengthening sales management, coaching. You know, this is the box that we play more, most in. Again, outcomes, more effective sales teams and sales management. Automation and innovation, or excuse me, performance uh, measures and incentive play. So we don't have comp, but we, I literally sit next to the head of comp, and we talk regularly on how do we change and look at our plans and, and quite frankly use a lot more evidence around what plans are going to generate 
quota retirement. And we all know that sales folks, no offense, are kind of coin operated, so we can't underestimate the importance of comp plans that are truly aligned. And we're putting a lot of focus on, on looking for the results. And it's not just did they hit quota, did they not, but look, analyzing what makes up a successful salesperson, begin to prototype that. Um, so real exciting area. Uh, outcome stronger engagement level, levels, reduced sales team, turnover. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Last one's uh, automation innovation. Not as much work in this space, but this is around the sales reporting and pipeline tools, and it's really educating our sales. We have 2,000 sales employees, so educating them on how to use sales, salesforce.com and how to properly set up the data that we will begin to mine as we go forward. So again, a lot of sort of emphasis on sales effectiveness. So we work with McBassey and company, and I don't think Lori, Lori uh, is here. Oh, she is. Hey, Lori. So uh, we, have a, we have a breakout session tomorrow. We're going to talk more about this. But so you think about you're an HR person, and you know, maybe your, your depth is learning. Maybe it's in OD. Maybe it's in talent. And we said, OK, let's just think about what are the things that could affect the success of our sales group. And the hypothesis was our spans of control were way too wide. We have, on average, every uh, sales lead has 20 AEs reporting to that lead. Think about that. Studies will tell you that's crazy. You know, that just, that you can't give any individual attention. You have 20 people working for you, right? And the, the relationship between a, a good sales leader coach and the AE is so critical for their success. So as I looked at this, my hypothesis was this is crap, sorry. This has got to be changed. There's no way these people can effectively get any kind of coaching from someone that has 20 reports. So we unleashed uh, Lori and team to take a look at all the data points that we had in our system and begin to look at the relationship between spans of control and quota achievement. And uh, the net net is if you, if you take a look on the horizontal, the number of directs starts with about 12. It goes up to 24. Can you believe that? And they're kind of clustered in the 20 range. On the Y axis, it's really, uh, that is the quota um, retirement or the percentage of quota that they attained over the fixed period. And so the good news here is that everyone overachieved. That's a good sign, right? Um, but the interesting point that we took from this was that reducing that span of control, although this would cost, what you think about 2,000 employees, it would cost us millions to change it from 1 to 20 to 1 to 18 or 1 to 12 or 1 to 14. You know, so costs, unbelievable costs, but from this data set, from this study, it wouldn't have benefited us. So it was one of those cases where the hypothesis we went into was actually disproved through evidence. And this was a very, you know, Lori and team did a lot of work to, to scrub the data, make sure that we controlled for variables that we felt would affect outcomes. And so doesn't mean we're, I'm going to stop on my you know, sort of effort to get smaller spans, but we don't have the evidence to support, just empirically, that that's going to change the outcomes. I know, uh, if you, you know we're going to have more dialogue about this kind of stuff tomorrow, but again, pulling those levers, what can we do using data, using predictive modeling, using different thoughts to come up with ways to make this better. And quite frankly, this is, I wouldn't advise this for everyone, but we did this a little bit in a black box because um, our organization is still warming up this concept of predictive modeling and you know, putting a lot of resources internally or externally into using data. Although we are first data, um, on the HR front, we're still on this journey. And we have to demonstrate that you know, we got the basics covered. And so this study, we thought, you know, let's just see what happens. We worked with the sales lead, but we didn't broadcast it uh, beyond that and basically you know, decide, OK, let's stay put. And that lever, we don't have to pull. Back to the Blackboard. Um, just talk about a couple more things, and then we'll move on to another topic. So user experience, someone mentioned that. Um, tied business outcomes, uh, quick wins, and solid measurement strategy. So I'll start with measurement, since that's a uh, topic of interest to this group. Um, this is just a pictorial on our strategy. So um, you know, we have level two assessments as kind of the baseline. Uh, metrics that matter. It was an easy decision for us to go to MTM because we didn't have anything in, in place. And you know, I would, I'd say this even if Kent is in the room. I mean, it's a world-class product, and it really fast-forwarded where we were uh, from a measurement perspective. Next level is, uh, is the performance data. It's all of the connectivity to succession planning, career planning, performance management, 
and that interplay between that and the metrics that matter, um, you know, sort of data sets. And the last is TDRP. I think many of you uh, have heard about TDRP. It's really exciting. We were um, excited to be founding members of TDRP. I think it's a, it's a great opportunity for us to change the conversation on what standards are. And I honestly think, you know, this is going to become the standard for executive reporting and having some level of consistency as we go forward. So um, that is sort of the pinnacle of our strategy. User experience. So we built MindSpring on a SharePoint site. And you'd say, really? You know, it is incredibly um, adaptive. And if you get the right experts to create, I mean, it looks like Web 2.0 or if it's 3.0. So the, the concept was, uh, we want this thing to be dynamic and constantly changing, have a lot of fresh faces of leaders in our organization. This is a carousel that rotates you know, regularly. Uh, and then you know, we actually, you can't really see it, but top right corner is gamification. So we did a couple games to see how that would play out. Uh, and you know, what was timely at this point was mid-year performance. So that was the front page. We put a lot of effort into you know, user acceptance to make sure this makes sense and people are using it the right way and constantly try to update it. Um, and we were lucky because we had an internal group of SharePoint experts that really did a nice job of creating this and were very flexible. So I mentioned the academy deans. Each academy dean has their page for their academy. And they got you know, their video up on the screen. But more importantly, they really helped design the look and feel and the content areas that they felt were most important. This is our leadership academy dean, Kelly Edwards. And then the, the, um, someone in the back mentioned the LMS. Um, does anyone? No, no one's hit. Um, so the LMS was a challenge for us, I'll be honest, because we didn't, over the years, put much time and attention into making it navigable. And if you saw what predated this, it literally looked like code. <laughs> uh, employees could not find stuff. It, wasn't, it just wasn't um, even up to what people were using 10 years ago. So we put a fresh face on it. We changed a lot of the navigation. Um, we still have a lot of work to do, to be honest, but we think about rolling this out on a global basis. We had to think about 20 different languages and connectivity to all the regions in the world. So that was one of the more challenging areas for us, quite frankly, is to make sure that this thing was uh, connected. It worked in every region, that we had enough multi-language content. Uh, we couldn't put everything into to 20 languages, but we got the core, you know, core materials that are all, all translated. So. All right, quick wins. Critical to us was to show that we're having an impact in, within a year. So literally, we stood it up uh, last March, a year ago. And so focus on sales. We, we had a huge sales uh, training event. Uh, 1,200 sales AEs went through. Um, we, we began to consolidate the various training groups and put them into a pod. Um, and I'll just flash over. So, the, the reality is, OK, so did that have impact year one? No. You would make the argument that we didn't hit our company goals. Our EBITDA goals weren't hit. But A, not to be defensive, it takes a little bit of time to get the training and the long sales cycle to really impact. But the reality is that we're talking about, does this connect to our EBITDA goals? And whether or not we get there, the fact that we're having that conversation is a starting point. I am convinced this has a contribution, and we are going to be uh, moving toward much more of that sort of um, conversation with our executives. But uh, a lot of stuff on product innovation, um, technical certifications. We're a tech technology company, so we created 73 technology certifications. 8,000 or so people got certified last year in their various technical area. Uh, all quick wins. Um, and then the learning assets, a bunch of stuff around uh, putting business skills um, and then upgrading our LMS. So, I think if you look on the right-hand side, the business impact, so clearly um, made an impact, I believe, on sales quotas, but not quite there. We're going to do better this year. Product awareness went up. Systems reliability went up. Our CEO said MindSpring was a game changer for our culture. And as we went around the company, it was evident that people are now believing that we are investing in them. And uh, you know, it, it, it was a real exciting opportunity for us. And the, the one dimension I can say definitively that we moved the needle big time we did a survey in 2011. The results were not very good. We had favorability in the 30 to 40 percent on career development, which is not good, obviously. We did that same survey a year later. That dimension went up 22 percent. 
So we know we made a difference, and this difference will affect you know, sort of the other business outcomes. So secret sauce and all this, and I know everyone in this room knows, this concept that people are your greatest asset, I don't think that's true. People aren't your greatest asset, great people are. And I had some of the greatest people on this, I can't tell you. And I thank some vendors in this room that allowed me to take their people and do this, all this great work. And I'm still working with them, and it was, uh, I say that in jest, but I actually got people, and the vendors were quite pleased to, to give us their talent so that we could create something really exciting. So, Lessons learned, laser focus on business goals. Uh, ask leaders what success look, looks like. I mean, I no, that sounds so fundamental, but it's so true. Uh, even if they can't articulate what success look, looks like, just having that conversation is really important. Uh, getting leaders to own the learning, getting some quick wins, quick wins that you can identify and begin to build on top. So, that's enough of MindSpring. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Did we have any surprises? Um, yes, we did. So I would say um, one surprise was it is hard to get the internal um, gymnastics around getting vendors on board. We, have a, we are basically, we deal with your credit card data. So we have to have very strong and, and you know, walls that are impenetrable. And so for us to go out to vendors that we are sharing information to them, email addresses and, and names, it's extraordinarily difficult to get through the process. And sometimes the vendors have you know, a, lot of, uh, a lot of lawyers and a lot of expectations on how those relationships work. So it literally took us, on average, nine months to get a new vendor on board, with the exception of one. And, uh, and that was painful. And I had no clue that was part of the dynamic. Um, the other was a pent-up demand. And just to see how something, it sounds so simple, but to create a learning opportunity for the masses and for our leadership just really begins to change the culture, and there's, you know, it, it really has taken hold, and, and, and these um, tons of people want to help, want to build, want to participate, so that was really cool. Um, trying to think of other surprises. Um, I think, the, you know, we had connectivity issues on a global basis, to be honest, and we're the product of a lot of integrations and acquisitions, so you don't know how that's going to play out until you test something out, and, and so that was a point of struggle. It still is, quite frankly. So those would be sort of three that I would say. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, can I have one captain's pick, another one? I'm sorry. Okay. I'm going to take it. IPO. Oh, actually, that was Michael's. You won. Okay, I'm sorry. You were vacillating between two and three, so I forgot. Okay. So IPO. Um, First Data was bought in 2007 for $29 billion by KKR. We were the third largest LBO in US history. You think about a, a company that is built on the economy when people use credit in 2007, and the debt structure that had to be put on top of that. You can imagine what happened in 2008. We were burning the furniture. It was cost-cutting galore for two years to get back, to be able to, quite frankly, pay debt and to make you know, our debt obligations. We had $24 billion of debt. So what was hopeful to be a two or three year run is now you know, year eight. It happens, it's not the end of the world. But when I joined First Data in 2009, they had literally taken, dismantled all of the HR programs no talent review, no performance reviews, surveys had been long uh, gone. They gutted a 45 employee talent management function, gone. You know, so you can see why there was a pent up demand to start building up in, in 2000, late 2009 when I was asked to kind of come in and help build it. Um, you know, I was a little bit skeptical, but I just, I'm a, I, I love challenge and I love innovation and this became, you know, sort of an opportunity after securing the question that there is support. We don't know what it is, but there is support to rebuild. So that was my charge as I came in, was to build a case around why do we want to reinvest in people? Why do we want to go back to you know, even just kind of a normal point of um, core HR processes? So I didn't have data. We had disparate systems all over, multiple HRS systems, ERP systems. It was, an, it was a mess, so I didn't have 
other than the fact that we knew our employees weren't happy, I didn't have solid data to use to build a business case. So these are the actual slides I presented to get the support to be able to fund our people investment. And when I say people investment, it was everything from retooling the LMS to leadership development to doing an engagement survey. So it was a lot of different things, including the university that you just saw. So the, the starting point of the conversation is that we are on a certain trajectory in 2009, it's the lower, or 2010, the lower bar, the blue bar is a current course in speed. And that is not exciting to anyone in our company because it is single digit EBITDA growth. We need to do better than that. And if you think about what gives you growth in any company, it doesn't matter what you're doing, it's your people. The people are creating the innovation. The people are you know, creating customer loyalty, customer satisfaction. The people are creating the technology. So a people strategy is critical for the success to have that more exciting orange trajectory. Simple concept for us. So we looked at you know, some successful IPOs over the last decade. And the question was to our executive committee, what do the most successful IPOs over the past decade all have in common? They all made Fortune's 100 best companies to work for shortly before or shortly after their IPO. Coincidence? Between 1984 and 2009, Fortune's 100 best companies to work for earned more than double the average return of public companies not on the list, 14% versus 6%. That's the critical part on this slide, by the way. More empirical studies, and I'm looking at Lori. She's done a ton of work in this space, uh, really demonstrating the connectivity between investing in people and business outcomes. Right? Again, look what's circled. So although I didn't have data and I, I you know, had to reach out to get research from others, I knew that they'd have a hard time refuting research done by their alma maters. Three of our EC members went to Harvard or Wharton. I know, it sounds silly, but they accepted the argument and they gave me a budget with enough zeros to do a lot of good stuff. There was an appetite, and I think in my sort of scenario is trying to be creative with the argument so that at least they get a perspective, and, uh, and it worked out well. All right, so let's do how to get C-suite support for learning. So I kind of gave you sort of a glimpse of one tactic that we used. Um, it's really important that you are articulate, business-driven, evidence-based, uh, what am I missing? That you're, that you're smart, you're credible, right? Those are the important things, so keep that in mind. <laughs> what are the two most common words used by every consultant out there? It depends, right? So it's very situational, I mean, we all know that, but these are some things, and you could add probably a few more things, and it's not just the C-suite, it's, it's articulating your business case to whoever you're trying to make the argument to. So a couple things that, um, that, that I've employed over the last year and a half. Uh, empathy, it sounds weird to say, you have empathy with your C-suite um, or board? Yeah, we do. You step in their shoes, and you try to figure out what are the biggest concerns they have, what are they trying to drive, and yes, they all wanna make obscene amounts of money, but that's a given. They all want top line growth. They all want revenue opportunities. They want new market expansion. And those things we need to translate into how can we begin to pull those levers to help effectuate that. So the credibility. So this one's key to, I think, what we're talking about at this conference, where you don't have to necessarily give them the 20-page um, empirically-based business case. I think a lot of this, I mean, the way I kind of think about um, what we're doing with knowledge advisors, it's building credibility that you're running your learning operation, your HR function as a business. I know it's cliche, but it's so true. So you build credibility before you even go into that boardroom. That you have your efficiency, you have your effectiveness metrics, 
and you are beginning to talk about business outcomes just like other leaders are doing. So building that credibility even before you have hat in hand. And let's be honest, when a CHRO or CLO goes for funding, we have a steeper hill to climb for a lot of C-suite leaders. And so removing sort of that specter of they're not really thinking about it as a business or does it really connect with, with top line growth, um, it's the credibility you're gaining to create an engine for measurement, an engine for reporting. And again, um, I know everyone knows that, but it's, I think it's so true. So this is meant to be a very C-suite sort of version of you know, how to look at measurement. Um, setting learning goals, and, and it's really putting yourself out there tying to very specific business outcomes. Even though you know it's going to be hard to prove, that's okay. You've got to start someplace. Monitor and report and other great things on there. So it's really a, the whole circle of monitoring, analyzing, and just keep doing it, doing it, and doing it. And start small and begin to build sort of this, you hear this process of measurement, not just a project around measurement. So the other thing that we thought was important was how does this stuff that we're pitching fit into a bigger sort of picture? And I, I, I'll be honest, um, I stole this concept from Josh, wherever Josh is. Uh, if we want to go, oh, maybe we're, there we go. So you saw Josh's framework. Well, we kind of said, let's find a big animal picture that we can use, that we will brand and use every single time we are presenting, not just to the C-suite, but to our colleagues and to people in HR, because it builds, you know, literally kind of shows you a connectivity to our business goals, uh, it, but it also shows sort of how all these pieces fit together. I use this slide no less than 50 times. And it, it built a, a brand bigger than what we were doing. And we, you know, honestly changed some of the words in these small boxes, but it didn't matter. They saw it, they're like, oh, okay, I get it. It's part of your overall strategy. And it really worked well for us. Um, and again, you know, this is, this is not just a, one, a point in time. We've done this human capital strategy for three years. So we continually update this, but this is sort of the framework that we like to present. So on the sort of the other side, so storytelling, attribution, marketing, um, you know, I've heard many people say that it's not just about, quite, you know, uh, storytelling, it's not just about empirical evidence, it's marrying those two and a story that sticks in, in their mind. And it really does have a much more compelling stickiness if you can wrap a story with good empirical data. And quite frankly, they don't want to see, I shouldn't say that, a lot of the C-suite doesn't want to see pages and pages of empirical evidence. They want that in the appendix, and they want to know that you did it, but honestly, it's really telling the story and, and the analytics around it that's key. All right, so um, the next topic, I think Sunny had asked for measurement that matters, wherever Sunny is. Okay, so we talked about this slide a little bit, but I can't overemphasize sort of the importance of the effectiveness and the efficiency, you gotta get the table stakes right. And these might look different depending on what you're, you're talking about, but you know, really focusing on um, all of the effectiveness metrics and efficiency metrics and then where those two collide so that you can make better decisions about how to optimize your programs. And so we've kind of presented this as just the general framework, very high level. This is you know, obviously um, not the most detailed version. So the next slide is really, thank you, Mr. Vance. Um, again, TDRP has really become kind of our beacon and how do we construct the reporting to really drive efficiency effectiveness and business outcome statements. Uh, we have, you know, literally it's taken us probably six months to get from starting to producing a report that I will show you. Um, we literally put that together, we got it finalized. We spent a boatload of time down in this bottom quadrant on the data sources. We knew that our data uh, collection systems were, I mean we had multiple LMS systems, we had financial systems that weren't linked, and so we knew that was a challenge, but it proved to be a bigger challenge than we expected. And you know, quite frankly, we decided, at least for the first pass, not to segment too deep into the organization, because we're actually going through a pretty big reorg right now, and knew that the data that we get um, isn't gonna be that helpful anyway. And if you get sort of, I call it smoke signals, at that high level, you can, dr you can drill down and spend more time focusing on the problematic areas as opposed to spending a lot of time segmenting and giving each leader sort of their results. So, um, you know, again, journey, just starting, but this is the framework that we're driving towards and we're committed to doing this. Um, so, 
I don't know if Mary, if you can go back to that last one, just one second. Um, so, you know, clearly you can apply this to any of the functional areas in HR. Uh, Talent Act is a perfect place for TDRP, leadership development, uh, performance management, total rewards. We're focusing on learning development. I mean, that, that is sort of our initial starting point. And um, no one to this day has asked me for any of this, right? I have never been asked for any metrics or measurement on learning. I, I, and I'm dumbfounded, but I know that we need to run this as a business and begin to establish a rhythm of using this to make a better function. And so we're putting this in place and we are gonna present you know, sort of um, our outcomes pretty quickly. But um, so uh, at the end of the day, you know, we're really trying to drive through these three statements. The, the key report right now is talent development support um, summary report, and that's the one that uh, we just literally got done. And so we'll go to the next slide. So this is our actual, and again, I know you can't read it, and that's probably good because there's some proprietary data on there, so I'm not gonna hand this slide out, but I wanted to show you, this is our first uh, L&D summary statement. And a couple things I would point out, you know, we literally said, what are those biggest business um, objectives? What are the biggest business priorities? And we put them on this page, both from an HR perspective, from a, from a company perspective. So we have EBITDA up here as number one. Um, and if you go, you know, for the people in the front, they can actually read it. But uh, also important to us, turnover, um, employee promotion rate, quick quits, which we define are people that quit within the first 12 months. Um, high performance turnover, huge for us to make sure that the quality of people that, not just that are coming in, but are leaving, and do we have any concerns there. And there's a, there's a bunch more metrics that we are beginning, KPIs that we're beginning to hold out as sort of those business objectives. So, um, and then you can't see it goes down a couple more rows, but effect, uh, effectiveness and efficiency are absolutely part of this. They're table stakes, again, got to make sure that we're um, capturing that, but the focus really is to change the conversation to get them think that, okay, your learning outcomes, your talent management does have impact. And one of the, one of the things Dave Vance taught me last year was even though you can't prove that you have that causal impact, you can ask them, does this have an impact in your estimation? Metrics that matter helps a lot in that conversation, but oftentimes it makes them think, and usually they say yes. If they say no, okay, well that's a different conversation. But usually they say yeah, yes, and then how do you get them to articulate what they think given their vast experience? How is that gonna contribute to that top line goal? goal? Um, subjective, but helpful because the, the leader is beginning to kind of translate what you're doing to their outcomes. All right, so there we go. So you think Billy Bean ever thought he'd be quoted at an analytics symposium in Miami, Florida? Um, I find it hilarious and I know a lot of, there's a lot of great analogies to Money, Moneyball and by the way, I think it's one of the greatest movies ever because I am a baseball fanatic, I love analytics and Brad, Brad Pitt's pretty cool. So, but the movie, was, I mean, you just think about what happened and, and the whole theme around Moneyball, and it applies so much to what we do. It's just phenomenal. If you haven't, I, I, I hope you've seen it. But, you know, so these are the gold standard of some of those things that we want to be able to demonstrate. The kind of, you know, we're, he's, he's developing winning teams. We're developing winning business strategies that have identifiable business outcomes. So, which employees have the highest contribution to your organization's profitability? Uh, at what levels do internal promotions lead to higher engagement levels? You know, does your equity program really increase retention? Uh, and so these are the questions that we are moving toward. We don't have answers for all of them. MTM is a starting point. TDRP is another nice step. But ultimately, this is where we're going because we need to demonstrate, again, that our investment in people is having impact in these areas. Right on time. All right. Um, let's go back to that list, if you don't mind, Mary. Let me just see if there's... Oh. Yeah, we can't go back. Okay. So, I'm going to ask you to stand up. If Kent Barnett has a playlist on his iPod, and there's two choices here. So, you get to pick. And if you pick correctly you get a free drink, actually two free drinks at the pool right after this <laughs> seminar. 
Okay, everyone that thinks it's playlist number one, stand up. Come on. Okay, playlist number two. I'll give you a hint. Who is this? Number one. All right. You guys get the free drinks. Thank you.